the Board of Education. But Lucky's paid more. <laughs> The years passed quickly and Don graduated from college, magna cum laude. <laughs> he went out to seek his fortune in radio. It was tough for him to get a job. First, he applied to that famous comedian, Fred Allen. I think this is the street Mr. Allen lives on. I'll uh, try this house. Howdy, Bob. <sighs> Pardon me, sir, but I'm looking for Fred Allen. You mean the fellow who's as corny as Kansas in August? Yes. Never heard of him. <laughs> he tried the next door. Ah, oh, what's going on here? Now, what are you doing? Ah, oh, how do you do? How do you do? Well, pardon me, sir, but I'm looking for Fred Allen. You mean that that fellow with the blarney stone under each eye? Yes. Never heard of him. <laughs> he tried the next door. Yes. Pardon me, sir. Are you Fred Allen? I would answer that, but I have no place to put all the prizes. <laughs> Goodbye, son. Don didn't get the job, but he never stopped trying. He was driven on by ambition, perseverance, tenacity, and Schwartz. <laughs> they were his agents. So next day, he went to see another big star of that era. Do you think you can use me on your radio program, Mr. Jolson? Ah. <laughs> then Donald left New York and came to Hollywood to seek his fortune. <laughs> Babe drove him out. <laughs> When Donald arrived in Hollywood, he lost no time in making an appointment with the greatest comedian that the world has ever known. A star whose position in the entertainment world has never been challenged. <laughs> it was with fear and trepidation that Don went to the home of this great, great star. Yes? <laughs> What can I do for you? Are you Jack Benny, the greatest comedian the world has ever known? The star whose position in the entertainment world has never been challenged? Ooh, am I? <laughs> so Don Wilson came to work for me, and he has been my announcer ever since. This made his father so happy that he flew out from Denver, climbed up on Don's knee, and sang... And when it came to winning blue ribbons I knew you'd show the other kids how With your voice so strong and clear We're so glad that you are here So stand right up and take a bow Oh, you must have been a beautiful baby Cause Don Z, look at you now I'll lift your option Don Z, look at you now Ladies and gentlemen, every year, fires that start through carelessness lay waste to approximately 30 million acres of timberland. Help prevent the shocking destruction of our forests. Be careful with matches, and when you smoke, never discard a match or cigarette without putting it out. Help fight fires. <laughs> Jack, will be back in just a moment, but first... 61. To give you a finer cigarette, Lucky's pay more. Yes, at the tobacco auctions, Lucky Strike pays more for fine tobacco. Millions of dollars more than official parity prices. And if you could stand in one of the great tobacco warehouses, you'd see plenty of action and excitement. You'd see basket after basket of tobacco go on sale. You'd hear the chant of the auctioneer as he sings out the bid. And as a basket of particularly fine, light, ripe leaf is offered, as the price hits the very peak bid again and again, you'd hear... And another basket of mild, mellow tobacco goes to Lucky Strike to make sure you get more, far more, smoking enjoyment from every Lucky you like. Yes, L-S-M-F-T, L-S-M-F-T. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. And in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. So smoke that smoke that's famous for fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. Yes, light up a Lucky, and you'll be convinced. Luckies are a truly finer, milder, more enjoyable cigarette. 
Make your next carton lucky strike. And we'll have more of this program, Joe's Retro Radio, in just a moment as we get to the uh, darker elements of the Halloween festivities for 2013. And we'll go back to a very, a very famous broadcast in just a moment. So stick around. Hi, friends. Did you miss a recent episode of First Cup? Or maybe you'd like to hear one or more of my old shows again. Then may I suggest a couple of convenient ways you could go back in time and hear an old show again. Check me out on Stitcher by either downloading the app from the opening page of my website, tinyurl.com slash Gunther's House, on your PC, Mac, Linux, or tablet computer, or on your smartphone at tinyurl.com slash Gunther Mobile. That's good on your Android, iOS, or Windows Phone. Also, you can check out this app by going to your phone's online store, or download the Spreaker app by going to your phone's online store as well. And welcome back to Joe's Retro Radio for the Sunday night, the 27th day of October 2013. And the War of the Worlds is an episode of the American radio drama anthology series, The Mercury Theater on the Air. It was performed as a Halloween episode of the series on October 30th, 1938, and aired over the Columbia Broadcasting System. Directed and narrated by actor and future filmmaker Orson Welles, the episode was an adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, the War of the Worlds, published in 1898. The first two-thirds of the 60-minute broadcast were presented as a series of simulated news bulletins, which suggested to many listeners that an actual alien invasion by Martians was currently in progress. Compounding the issue was the fact that the Mercury Theater on the Air, a sustaining show, it ran without commercial breaks, adding to the program's realism. Although there were uh, sensationalist accounts in the press about a Supposed panic in response to the broadcast, the uh, precise extent of the precise extent of list response has largely been debated. Now, in the days following the adaptation, however, there was widespread outrage and panic by certain listeners who had believed the events described in the program were real. The program's news bulletin format was described as cruelly deceptive by some newspapers and public figures, leading to an outcry against the perpetrators of the broadcast. Now, despite these complaints, or perhaps in part because of them, the episode secured Wells' fame as a dramatist. Okay? Continue on with my notes here. Bear with me. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background of the H.G. Uh, Wells' original novel. It relates to the story of an alien invasion of Earth. The radio play's uh, story was adapted by, written primarily by Howard Coach and... Uh, and Froelich, with input from Wells and the uh, rest of the Mercury Theater on the Air staff. The setting was switched from 19th century England to contemporary Grover's Mill, an unincorporated village in West Windsor Township, New Jersey, in the United States of America. The program's format was a simulated live newscast of developing events. To this end, Wells played recordings of Herbert Morrison's radio reports of the, Hind of the Hindenburg disaster for actor Frank Riddick and the rest of the cast to demonstrate the mood he wanted. The broadcast employed techniques similar to those of the March of Time, the uh, CBS News documentary, and dramatization radio series. Wells was a member of the program's regular cast, 
having first performed on the March of Time in 1935. The uh, Mercury Theater on the Air and the March of Time shared many cast members, as well as sound effects, Chief Ora D. Nichols. The first two-thirds of the 60-minute play was a contemporary retelling of events of the novel, presented as news bulletins interrupting another program. This approach was similar to Ronald Knox's satirical newscast of a riot overtaking London, broadcast by the BBC in 1926, which may have influenced Wells. A year later, in 1927, a drama aired by uh, Adelaide Station 5CL depicted an invasion of Australia via the same techniques and inspired reactions similar to those of the Wells broadcast. Wells had been influenced by the Archibald McLeish dramas, The Fall of the City, and Air Raid, the former of which had used Wells himself in the role of a live news reporter. However, the approach had never been taken with as much continued verisimilitude and innovative format as has been cited as a key factor in the conclusion that followed. Though realistic, the play does use time skips at one point going from the start of a battle to the final casualty count within just a minute. But without further delay, here is a rebroadcast of that broadcast from uh, 1938, 75 years ago, as a matter of fact, Orson Welles and the War of the Worlds. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. Near the end of October, business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. For the next 24 hours, not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We take you now to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With a touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Compensita. <laughs> 